my name is Alois. Uh, a bit of my background, so I usually I'd like to start my talks, why you should actually even listen to me, so you even know what I'm talking about. So some background regarding open source and myself. Um, I was running a lot of our community and standardization activities at Dynatrace early on. Initially, we started to do a lot in W3C, more in the standards development and influencing some development um, on the browser side. Then we started to engage more and more into open source, which then led to like, creating the first dedicated open source team, uh, which we then kept uh, growing. And as we kept growing it, we uh, established an entire business unit that Dynatrace is responsible for open source. Bit more details on, on what we're doing there before, but it's really was taking it from zero uh, to a reasonable number of people who are fully dedicated to open source. Uh, today's talk is about beyond OSPOs. Um, the idea is really that by the definition and what I learned talking to a lot of people who ran OSPOs, a lot of this was triggered by the Linux Foundation member summit uh, conversations I had last year in Lake Tahoe. Um, that we kind of like follow a bit of a different approach and we kind of took it to a next level and wanted to more, do more uh, than many OSPOs uh, do today, give you some background why we're doing it, how we structure it, and how we actually made it uh, work. Also doing this a bit under the idea of like we have some additional economic pressure right now, like how do I justify the value of the work we're doing in open source, um, how do I position it inside a company, and also how do I do it in a company um, uh, where, whose main business is to sell commercial software that's not necessarily tied to open source. So a bit about open source at Dynatrace, so some background. Dynatrace is an observability and security company, so we build sec uh, security and uh, observability products. We have been doing this for a very long time. Our software that we sell to customers is SaaS-based and most of that software is actually proprietary. So most of the software by itself is not open source um, for a number of reasons. One of them being that some of those components are only valuable to us inside, inside the company. Some of it contains technologies that would only be relevant to us or our competitors. At the same time, we are using a lot of open source and collaborating in the open source space, for example, around open telemetry and the whole ecosystem on data ingestion, automation, integrating into the cloud native ecosystem and so forth. So the interesting thing to, to understand here really about how we're doing open source and, and how to look at all of this. We have a, I think for our company of, of our size, a reasonably large investment in open source and none of these open source components are integrated into any components in Dynatrace that directly generate ever any revenue. So it's not that we have this open core model on this software, we kind of try to do it once. It's not really what we are necessarily good at, but we in believe and invest in open source where it makes sense and contribute to the business. So just bringing this up that you have some understanding of how to do this in a company that doesn't even want to make money out of the open source components that you're building, at least not directly. We have three major open source projects that we contribute to in, in total, I said it's like roughly 200, but we talk about the ones we are strategically contributing to two of them we have actually founded or co-founded and one that we are contributing to. One is the Open Feature Project, one is the Captain Project, and the third one is Open Telemetry. All of those projects we joined very early on. Uh, Captain, we were a founding member, Open Feature, we initiated and founded it. And Open Telemetry, we collaborated on a lot of the work that was done there. Also the uh, related work that that's happening within the W3C around trace context, which was also founded by us. What you will see about all of these projects that they very much have a certain standardization touch to them. Open features standardizing how to write uh, feature flagging code in your application, how to define feature flags, how to manage them. The Captain project, how to get the observability and automation in a standardized way into Kubernetes and open telemetry, how to capture standardized uh, telemetry data. So a lot of what we do is create standards across the industry and core areas where we see them fit and honestly where we want to have standardization so it's easier for us to interact in these markets. Overall, the team at Dynatrace on the open source side is roughly 50 people. It keeps uh, steadily growing as we grow on, on projects. And starting from zero to 50, I think is a good uh, trajectory uh, that we have been on. We keep usually growing at a reasonable size every year depending on project contributions and the, the areas that we contribute to. 
when we talk about contributions, this is not just about code contributions. So we also take care of community management. We take care of documentation for some of those projects, uh, support them also on the governance side and on the technical committee side. So this is not just code only. We help where the project needs help um, and, and support those projects there. So when we looked into OSPOS and like the whole idea of, of creating an open source program office, we, we saw some challenges. I think there's goods and bads, and this is obviously my very personal view. Um, and then why did we decided to go for, for a different approach? So OSPOS very often are advisors only. And the only here is obviously under exclamation mark. It's very important what OSPOS are doing and how they're helping the company. But they're not actively contributing and creating uh, the open source components and they're not contributing to uh, creating artifacts that are directly related to the business in a sense. Yes, they drive open source compliance and administration. That's great, that's important. We got a lot of questions about this. We have to take care of this. When we started the whole activities and my colleague David here can tell you a lot about how to get a couple of hundred projects compliant to most open source policies. We help, this, help people to do it and support them. We review and advise internal projects, so not all projects need to come directly from our team. There's always people who want to start a project, we actually help them to do this, and then also act um, in a way that we can like fit this into a business model, help develop them, and then either decide whether they want to move forward or not move forward. Uh, scouting for interesting projects is what I heard some are supposed to, like rather developing something internally, looking at other, um, uh, projects that are out there, sometimes we also get uh, asked by colleagues like which project we should pick, which others we should not invest, how to look at a project, whether it sells you or not, or where to look for alternatives, and how we can ensure the sustainability of a project. So if you have a core project that we don't want to like run and um, like really be like in the, in the driving seat, we still want to ensure its sustainability in case we build it deeper into the product, obviously. Uh, um, so that was the plus side. The minus side was this traditional OSPO model. Is you're not really driving the actual open source work. So you're not doing the coding, the community work. All of this is usually left to other teams that are outside of the OSPO. Um, you're not directly aligned to business goals. And I know this might be a bit up for discussion when I talk about business goals. Yes, you're aligned maybe to a business vision and maybe to some of your business priorities. But do you share goals with the commercial product teams or not? In our case, it was very important to share the same goals that we are measuring, we can be measured by the means of the business and can show active business contributions and also agree with the respective uh, business owners on this. And last but not least, not really being responsible for business outcomes. I know this might sound a bit scary, you're in the open source world, you have to influence the community, work with them on consensus and still you should be responsible for business outcomes. For me, coming from a from a background where I was leading my own business unit, this was like obvious. If I take responsibility some, about something, I have to be responsible for the outcomes. Like how can I not be responsible for the outcomes if I'm doing this? Like why, why even, I would even go to my boss and ask him, why are you even paying me if you don't even care what the outcome of my work is? I mean, it's a, it's a nice idea, but at some point it wouldn't be that obvious. So if, it's, if you're more the consulting side, you're missing out on these actual topics. And we didn't like this. That's why we decided to go for a different structure that I'll walk you through. <laughs> Uh, just to take it away, our core engineering teams are part of our open source business unit. Open source is a product at Dynatrace. It happens like every other business unit. So how do we do this? Uh, starting very uh, from the top conceptually. Obviously, every, every now and then uh, we want to start or contribute to an open source project. Actually, both are relevant. Step one is strategically modeling the project not having developers, hey, we built this tool, it's actually great, it helps solve a lot of problems. Or sometimes we're also in a situation where we are acquiring companies, like every bigger company does. They have some open source projects going on. We have to take the strategic decision. Do we want to continue those projects? How do they fit into our overall business plan? And so forth. And also if we say, well, we want to invest more development resources, uh, development talent, and, and support the project, also understanding how that project works. So for us, it's really key to understand how a project works the same way a business works. The way we do it is using the open source canvas. This is more or less a business model canvas adaptation specifically for open source projects. So it's not only focused on business, it's focused on the core project. 
the audience, community, and also business value. Why did we create this? It just helps us whenever we engage with a project to ensure that all the important questions are answered. There's a link down there where you can uh, download it. Obviously, the open source business, the open source canvas is open source. Um, so feel free to download and modify it. So one of the most important questions, why is this thing actually open source? This is something we keep asking people. It's like, yeah, because we want to have community engagement. No, no, why is it open source? How does it help us to run something open source versus running it proprietary internally at the company? Because from our experience, running something open source is somewhere in the range of 30 to 50% more expensive than building it entirely in-house. And you're also significantly slower if you have to develop something in a purely consensus space instead of one product manager telling a team what to develop. Yes, once it gains momentum, once you reach your goals, you're going to be faster, but especially in the beginning where you're looking for traction, where you're looking for fast progress, honestly building a lot internally might be a much quicker way to do it. Especially the way we'd like to do it, we don't want to, we, where we have been more successful is not creating a project first and open sourcing it and then getting buy-in. Our fastest growing projects are actually those where we got consensus across other parties we wanted to collaborate with before we wrote the first line of code. Part of this was also obviously understanding, okay, why would the community care? And what type of interactions are we getting with the community? And who is actually our community? Like, who are the people obviously who use the project? But who will be future maintainers? Who do we envision to be a maintainer of this project? And, and why would they be maintaining it? And why would their companies um, fund them to maintain it? I think everybody in here knows like there's this idea that somebody just doing this for altruistic purposes, that's not really true. That's not how open source is built. And the really big projects are built by companies who have a commercial interest in these projects being successful. So then going all down to the community side, what do we have to do there? On the top left, a very important question uh, that uh, as we have recently seen, some companies haven't answered properly um, and change the licensing models. How does the success of my open source project and people using my free open source project help my business be successful? So how is the success and the wide usage of my open source process having a positive effect on my business and not becoming a threat that people rather go for the open source version and not my commercial, uh, commercial offering or the commercial offering of somebody else? Which, as we all know, in some cases, then leads to license changes that restrict you from certain usage um, and making your users and a lot of people unhappy. And we answered this question right from the beginning. Very often we get the pushback, yeah, we'll figure this out once we're successful. It's, it's kind of like too late. Yeah? It's like getting a prenup when you always want to divorce somebody. That's way too late to have this discussion. Yeah? It's, it's, the discussion should be happening much earlier. Not that giving any like, relationship advice here, but I think you get the idea. Like, figure it out before you're successful how it's happening there, because otherwise, um, you're not going to be happy there. And for us, this is a key question. And then we also define the investments up front. Uh, very often when we have discussions, yes, I do this on the side. And you don't do anything on the side that you want to be successful. You need to have a dedicated set of people. You need to get your resources, like simple things. And talk to developers, yes, let's send swag to all of our maintainers that you have zero marketing budget. If you want to have marketing budget, we have to get you this marketing budget. So that's how we structure and work with these projects and give it to them also as a checklist. What the outcome of this is that sometimes even the developer says, no, this is not really what I want to do. This sounds too businessy or can't answer all of those questions. And sometimes it then provides also the input that we use them and obviously presenting it to um, our CEO, CTO to take that investment and to fit it into a broader business context. It usually helps us to be way more prepared and it's a fair way of judgment and also for people learning along the way. Uh, step two then really is about corporate alignment. Uh, okay, now we have, we understand we actually have a strategy beyond writing cool code or want to like build something that makes the world a better place. Having an idea, now we really need to align it. And what we do, we really drive these alignment sessions top down. So very short primer how we do it, like most companies do it. We have like very high level goals uh, that directly come like from the CEO top down. These are our mission critical goals. They moved into what we call like uh, needle movers. The first line was mission critical goals. Long story short, we build nothing open source that's not aligned to any goal in the company because we simply can't. Sometimes we do it a bit more forward looking, but that's a different discussion. 
Then we define how towards these mission critical goals, what are the most important activities that we need to take. That's what we call needle movers. I know every company has different words for it. Um, and then we see how open source can help there. Then we define how, how these um, uh, open source initiatives actually have business impact against hard goals. This is not community growth. This is not contributions. Nobody actually cares in, the, in your board how many contributions, how many stars you get, how many maintainers you have, how many conferences you've spoken at. That's the hard truth. They care how you contribute to the bottom line of your business. And that's fair. And then obviously we define the funding and funding obviously goes in line with business impact. So we plan the same way we plan everything else on the product side. We were actually part of the same planning cycle as every other part of the product. We have to uh, provide the same materials. We have the same business reviews as everybody else in the company. So we treat open source exactly the same way. This for us was quite a journey to get there. But when I took it over, that was my primary goal to come from, okay, we give you some money to do some open source to know I want to be liable to the business. I want to be aligned to the business. I want to everybody look at what we're doing here uh, constantly all the way up uh, to our CEO. So this is a bit abstract. Let's give you two examples how this works in the real world. And now coming to like, how do we execute the strategy? Uh, this is actually not a great secret. These are actually Dynatrace examples that you see in here, but if you would spend a little bit of thinking, you would come to the same. Giving you two examples. One is open telemetry. What's our business goal? Increase market share and observability. Duh, an observability company that wants to get market share and observability, quite obvious. So now you know one of the strategic goals of Dynatrace you might have known before. So how do we do this? We get more observability data from our customers. So we increase our market share by getting more customers and getting more data from our customers, right? Pretty obvious. What is, hold, what is kind of keeping us back from this? The quality of uh, open telemetry data. So very often a lot of these libraries were written. Uh, data was not properly tagged, which means we couldn't use it in our product. Customers did not see the data. The data was in the wrong format. Some of our Analytics and the eye capabilities were not working properly on the data, so it had no value for these customers. So that's why they were not sending us more data, because why should they if it's not working properly, right? One approach would obviously be tell the customer that the data is wrong, but that doesn't help you a lot either. Tell the customer, hey, you sent me something, I don't know what to do with it. Even if it's somebody else's fault, it doesn't help your business, right? So how did we resolve this? We decided that one of our strategic needle mover goals was we want to ensure the quality of observability data across all the major technology stacks we see out there that what we get has the quality that we want. How did we do this? We decided, well, we're getting part of the open telemetry initiative around semantic conventions. So actively contributing to semantic conventions, taking some work we have internally at Dynatrace, contributing it, working with the teams there, showing that all of this is aligned. And just obviously specifications by themselves do not really help a lot. We also support the implementation. So we ensure that they make it into the SDKs, the libraries, contrib repositories, and so forth as quickly as possible. Even going further, helping uh, for third party uh, projects uh, that we see widely used by our customers, uh, building additional components. That's for example, how the Captain project came along, what it basically does. It adds on top of Kubernetes the ability to do observability and tracing for your Kubernetes deployments across individual deployments for like entire applications and then attach actions to it. And it just tells me that I have a presentation, which is actually right. The, the switch that you see here, the lower part is the business goals, the upper part are the open source goals. So how do we measure success now? We track our interest volume. Do we get more open source data? That was our goal in the beginning. Do we get more data that we can work with? Assuming that we roll it out to a wide amount of frameworks that are important to our customers, improving those frameworks, our interest volume should go up. And obviously the percentage of proper open telemetry data. And what you will notice now, like why is this here on the right and not divided by open source and commercial? Because it's actually the same goal. A goal over here to get more observability data is tracked by the percentage of proper data and the overall interest volume. The success of our open initi source initiatives can be measured by the, um, the amount of proper open telemetry data we get as con to contributing to those libraries, plus the overall interest volume as customers are sending us more of this data. 
So the goal of open source is exactly the same as of the business. And as mentioned before, what you can see here, there's no contributions, there is no stars, there is no anything else at that level that we care about. But everybody understands why we're doing it and everybody can assign a number value to those interest values which we are measuring and we can design the priorities how much we want to invest there. Giving you another example on open feature, except the same modeling framework. And uh, yeah, obviously feel free to copy it for your, your own way. So what do we, what's one of our goals? We want to support more developer use cases. So we want to use, support developers use observability. Also obvious for an observability company. So we need to best understand progressive delivery. There's actually a typo in here, um, which we progressively need to change later on. So we want to understand when people roll out new functionalities, when they turn on feature flags and so forth. That's a key goal. We, we, not, we no longer have like one single release in production, as all of us know. We have multiple versions in the Blue Canary deployment. We even have like this complexity of different features being turned on by different users, and we need to understand this data properly and easily. What was holding us back? Uh, too many implementations. So there's like roughly maybe 40 feature flagging providers out there with libraries across amongst 10 languages. That sums up to like roughly 400 libraries that you need to support that all of kind of do the same thing, but slightly different. So it's a total mess. <laughs> and then you realize that all of these libraries kind of like do the same thing, but not exactly the same way. So again, what was the goal on the open source side? Let's strive for a common standard of those libraries. Most of those libraries back then already were open source, but were developed by individual companies not collaborating. So that's why we started out and initiated the Open Feature Project. The goal of the Open Feature Project was to create a standard for feature flagging across languages with standard SDKs and a provider architecture where you can plug in pretty much any backend that you want. Right now we are moving even like having a flag definition and rule evaluations built across uh, vendors. So what we then did, again, we didn't start the project, we didn't even start writing the code, we talked to everybody in the industry who built something like this and had all the hard conversations in the beginning. Like imagine going to a market leader like Launch Darkly and said, well, we want people no longer to use your SDKs, but an SDK that's built consensus by 15 or 20 vendors out there. So we more or less built a business validation deck that we gave to people who we wanted to participate that they could take to their CTO so that they could make an argument why to do it. That was most of my work in setting up this project. It was not cheering up people. It was not about setting up uh, GitHub projects. It was not setting up about calendars. It was not finding an amazing logo. It was really about helping those people justify it internally. When once we got beyond critical mass, we started to actually work on it and ended up in this case with the project was moving really fast. So we had our 1.0 release of the SDKs six months after we initially started the project. We had alignment that was good enough in the project, although it was seen, submitted to the CNCF to be under foundation coverage. And for some reason, like the CNCF processes were a bit slow. We were not even under foundation management where the whole team across companies was already writing code. Uh, that's how we could keep up with that speed. Right now we have covered already all major languages and today have also con sorry, end user companies like Spotify, in our case an end user company, contributing dedicated SDKs, uh, Google contributing, all the major vendors starting to contribute and the community like really actively driving this. But the main work was really getting the community on board. So this is not a code goal. The code goal, the goal in the very beginning was getting 15 people on board to agree working on a common implementation. Yeah, and obviously we actively support uh, the implementation. So some of the SDKs have been written by us. Uh, usually where we see where we have to support more, uh, honestly, it's much easier to find people contributing code than those running your community than taking all the uh, job board and carry water work, which we often contribute, uh, but supporting this and uh, driving a lot of the implementation work forward. And again, how do we measure this? Same story here track usage amongst our customers. So that's what we want on the commercial side plus what we want on the open source side. So the more people we see using open feature and obviously tracking usage of your open source project in the wide world of all the software companies out there is a very hard problem to solve. 
tracking it amongst the customers or the, the people who you care about, your customers, and the, and, the, and the prospect is much easier, especially if you're an observability company. Like we know which libraries are loaded and how much of them do we see. The second one was obviously track supporting companies. So when it's also obvious when we interact with a customer who is already using a feature flagging solution, uh, can they use the SDKs and are they using the SDKs and are they provided by these feature flagging companies? Again, what you see here, the goals for the open source side and the goals for the commercial side are exactly the same. So we report on the same number that the commercial arm is interested in and we're even aligned in driving them. Time horizons might be a bit different, like when we start working obviously on adoption, it takes a couple more quarters or a year or so until we see it in customer. Always customers showing up, I think that's quite, that's quite natural there. But the overall goals are the same. And like using this modeling approach like really helped us justify why we're doing it. And I mean, to be honest, it looks very simple if you put it on the slide and like totally obvious. Usually when you start off, it takes some time thinking, but that's also why I wanted to provide this framework. It's like really how you break down goals, which barriers do you hit, how does open source help you to overcome this and then finding like a joint measurement. And again, what you see here, no contributions, no stars, nothing. These are things we track internally, obviously, but at the CFO level, nobody cares. <laughs> if you still believe that the CFO cares about your GitHub stars, no. So how do we run this department? And I think that's also somewhat different. I mentioned it in the beginning. In order to do this, we need to drive implementations independent of product. This is a bit of an eye chart, but this is more or less uh, the, the chart of the department. We have, as I mentioned, this is an entire business unit. We structured it like any other business unit. This is actually important for two reasons. Reason number one is you have everything in there that you need to run a business, which is super helpful. Reason number two, which I think is even more important, is that other business units understand how to interact with you. They need who to talk to. People have the same names. We have somebody who is a go-to-market product manager. We have somebody who is responsible for growth, like all the other solutions. So if somebody else needs something from us on a growth perspective, they know who to talk to. So this most likely is not going to be exactly what you would need, depending on how your business works, the key takeaway should be model yourself in a way that the rest of the organization understands how to interact with you. We do actually the same, like we have, we're using Jira internally for products, we have a structure on how we break down um, all of our dev work in a variation of uh, scaled agile, we do the same. You might say, but open source projects don't work that way. No, they don't. But our success is that for them we mimic the behavior of the rest of the product organizations and fit ourselves in there. Like we take open source roadmap items, we fit them in, you would find things like on the open telemetry roadmap that are actually part of what we call like a value increment in our commercial product roadmap so that people can like work with it and align with it. This by the way also like allows us to very directly track the impact on product deliverables. So if it's to take a certain feature, or we, got, we call it like a value pack, something we ship to the customer, I could directly uh, see how much of this was actually related to open source. If your question is now, how do you handle something like contributing to community meetings, uh, being on a TC, being on a governance board? We model it as maintenance, just as you would do with software. For software, you have new for product development, and you have maintaining what you have out there and keeping the project running. That's where we would put it in there. Yes, we have the highest maintenance rates compared to other product units, but that's just realistically how it works. And it's obvious, say, well, we don't, if we don't do this, we kind of lose status, we lose the influence, and like this part of the product will be impacted. So obviously there is like open source as a department with the department head, and then we have open source product managers. Yes, we have for all of those products, independent uh, product managers on our side, there is a counterpart also on the product side. They have a slightly different scope. So there won't be an open telemetry product manager on the product side. There will be one for, as we call it, application observability that we interact with, but they are more or less interacting with each other. And we do this for every project. The difference between the two, one is really focused on product delivery, one is focused on upstream and upstream integrations. I'm a big fan of having people, when they wake up in the morning, think of one thing they need to care about today, single-threaded leadership. You will never get this if you do product and open source at the same time. Your planning horizons will also be different. 
We do the same for engineering. Yes, the engineering teams, as for every business unit, they report directly to open source. All upstream contributions and upstream integrations are built by the dedicated engineering teams um, that are part of open source, so they're not part of product. Um, and I'll come to why we do this. This is usually a reason for discussion, right? And they're part of the product teams. And some anecdotes to share. We have, still have open source enablement that's helping other people to start open source projects. Actually, that has become less and less of where we put the effort. Some of the work we integrated into overall processes at Dynatrace and um, other departments. And uh, as we have set up the basics, this is working better. And then we have a go-to-market organization that consists of community growth, architecture and development. Uh, so architecture and development actually does two things. It helps us to integrate with other open source projects. So we have people take care, like how do we integrate our open source projects with other open source projects in the community at an architecture level? How do we integrate it with the entire product stack? How do we integrate them into like an overall customer solution? How can we help like our internal support systems work with this? So we not just do the upstream contributions, but we also help the organizations to actually consume and work with those projects. And obviously then we have the DevRel team. In our case, DevRel, uh, people are not called DevRels. Well, they are called to the outside world, but internally they act as go-to-market uh, product managers and they also follow the guidance of go-to-market product managers because that's kind of technically what they do. You could argue they do more than this and they do it differently, yes, but again, the rest of the organization needs to understand how you work. And if somebody says, hey, how can we talk about this open telemetry feature or how about this open feature thing that we want to talk to, you know exactly who to go to. Again, this is how we do it. Uh, you might, it might look different for your organization. Uh, but the, the, the key message should be engineering is a core part of it. You have dedicated product management and you mimic the structure of the rest of the organization so nobody has to learn how to interact with you. That's the question we often get. Like, why is it not part of the product teams? Like, why is open telemetry not part of your open, um, of uh, your observability product team? Why is open feature not part of like uh, some of our automation uh, capabilities? Why isn't this part of like the regular product teams? And there's actually a number of good reasons why this isn't the case. First of all is focus. Again, single-threaded leadership. The first thing that happens if you take engineers that work on open source and product, put them under the same product management that the open source engineers will stop working on open source and help out on the product where it's super critical. That, that, that's like clockwork, that's going to happen. What we actually had, we actually had this like very, very in the beginning, and it's actually a really interesting story. We had. We took some of the people working on open source back to the core product teams, and the other thing happened. They started to work on core product more than on open source. Then those people wanted to work on open source again. So what did they do? They then applied for a role again in the open source business unit to work on open source. So the key learning there was if you want to like twist it that way, the system self reorganizes in a way that actually works better. Why did they want to do it? Because also they're like, daily routines were around us, are different, the way they're interacting with others, and even more, a lot of the commercial people who then had to do something on the open source that didn't want to do this. Like, why do I have to argue with somebody? I'd rather take a ticket from my backlog, work on it, rather than arguing with 15 people on the internet about this. I know what I'm doing, I can do it, and I don't care about the opinion of 15 other people, which is totally fair. Um, which leads like, to different skills. Working in open source and working in a commercial environment is totally different. The processes are totally different. Actually, as a developer in open source, that's also why we brought in the PMs. If you work with enhancement proposals, if you work with interactions, if you have to take a lot of calls to convince people, you might argue that also happens on the product side, but at some point you realize as a product manager, your power to influence the product depends a lot on your contributions. And, a lot on like how you can get other people on board and convince them. Not when it's easy, not when you're just adding something, but when people have different opinions. You need different problem resolution skills in an organization. Like what do you do worst case if we two are at the same level and we totally disagree, we go to our manager and let them resolve the issue. If we two work for different companies, totally different situation. So the skill set is different, the people who want to do it is different. 
And also for us, as we run most of our engineering out of Europe, so we have a mix of like Europe and then East Coast US because we can cover both work with European colleagues and uh, West Coast US easily. You have to convince them to stay later. And you have to have people who want to come to work later, but then stay later because unfortunately people on the West Coast get up much later than they do in Central Europe, believe it or not. Different horizons. So what we also do, like sometimes we have to invest in something that might not get relevant for the problem in the current fiscal year, or that's not part of the current business results. We still have to do it because of strategic importance. A product manager on the product side would never prioritize this because it's not his job and it's not what he should do. A product manager in the open source leadership, we need to take bets into the future. And we have the freedom to do so. So right now, it could say it's almost like a mix of something 50% direct product contributions that help immediately and 50% strategic bets that we are taking because we think that's where we're moving. That's also why 50% of the work is actually funded by the product teams directly and the rest comes from open source where we have this freedom. And obviously this varies over time. Like if there's a big new development in one of the open source projects and we have to work way more upstream to get this stable, there's less of the big bets that you're working on. So it always worries, but usually the horizon is different. As a product manager, you have to deliver always with the next release. On the open source side, you might, in many cases, get something ready for the next fiscal year uh, to then be part of your product port portfolio. And that's your only horizon you're focusing on. And again, think with the leadership. What do you think about in the morning? You can't think about two things at the same time. Yeah, and I mentioned like the mindset, um, how, you do, how do you want to work? Get a task to the best way possible being done or Discussing with other people, not doing it the best way, but the way everybody agrees on. Deferring something you consider important, doing it six months later when people also understand why you wanted to go there. Maybe bringing somebody else on board, having the tough discussions, like rather getting it done. That's what we saw. Like we have people say, yeah, like, we, can you get us this into open source, please? I mean, I proposed it, there's like 15 people shouting at me right now. And like this thread is so long, I don't want to do it. I'm happy to implement it like once everything moves forward. Even this is sometimes what the open source team does. We have experts from the product come in helping with the implementation, but we help them to get this into uh, the whole open source flow. Uh, to wrapping up here, uh, adjustment that we needed to make along the way. Actually, we renamed the team in the beginning. It was called open source. What led to that everything that's on GitHub was suddenly our responsibility, even if we never created it and were never responsible for it. Because we're the open source team. Hey, it's in GitHub. It's our job. No, it's actually not. That's why we renamed it to upstream contributions and integrations. We are responsible for upstream work and integrating it into the product. That's also how we relate to the product. For example, if there's new capabilities in OpenTelemetry that need a product integration, we also support this part. It's not that everything we do is open source, but it's always open source related. In this case, sometimes the skill set in the open source team is higher to build some of those integrations than from the core product teams. Or to mention, follow your standard product development process. Uh, don't try to be the unicorn in development. That never works for big organizations. If you have, I think, more than 500 and as many organizations here, a couple of thousand of developers, don't try to be special. That's not helping you either. The more you can align with what works in the organization, the better it does. For us, it, it did like really mimicking the behavior. People know how to work with you, processes flow smoothly, and you know how to integrate. Uh, drive towards full business accountability. Try to be responsible. I know it sounds scary, like not everything is under your control. Sometimes things are late, sometimes things do not get built. Yes, that's, but that's how business happens anyways. You never know exactly what's happening in the market, but at least have an opinion on how you want to contribute to the business and communicate it openly. And have an agreement that what you're doing is important to the right people. Yes, it might be scary going that far, but I think it's really what's changing a lot of things. Yeah, and the last thing, independence versus product driven. Briefly mentioned this as well. We try to do some things independently from product schedules because we consider them important and we think these are key new initiatives. Um, and at the same time, have to do something that the core product teams need to do on the open source and we kind of need to balance in between. And that's actually the management responsibility here. Like, here, like they have this constant balancing act. Like how far do you lean? Where do you help? Where do you set priorities? When do you actually say no to product because you think there's something on the horizon that the team is working on that's going to be so important than six months from now that it has bigger impact than what the product team might need from you right now? Again, a lot of, of conversations and that's also what you do. So that's basically it. Uh, that's uh, just giving you 
and idea how we do open source, and slightly different from traditional OSPO approaches, sharing some examples of how we do it. Obviously open for questions, discussions, agreements, disagreements. Disagreements are sometimes interesting. And yeah, opening up the stage to you. Yes? That left me thinking. Yes, it is. And I was like, well, yeah, if you don't document your code, if you take shortcuts, it's just easier to do it behind closed doors than the open, right? But do you, are you thinking of some other examples? Uh, it is faster in the beginning, and if you're, especially if you're building the same thing, and it's very important, if you build the same thing and you build it in consensus with 10 other companies, you are significantly slower getting consensus, agreement, and everything done on this piece of code than doing it first. It's not just about shortcuts and not documenting. But if you have one product manager and one architect deciding what to do, you're faster than doing it with a lot of others. That's my point. Consensus takes longer. In the long run, if this is your goal, it's totally fine. Uh, but sometimes we, and, and I can give you an example, sometimes we prototype things internally which we later on use in the open source project and get it to production quality it is significantly faster there because we are not asking other people for opinions, we don't go for agreements, we do not have to take considerations what it means for other people's product integrations. We build what's best for us and not what's best for 10 people. And some, sometimes people have um, interest in their companies that they also have to cater to that, um, that you wouldn't even be concerned with if it was just an implementation for you. To give very one concrete example, we worked with one big cloud providers and we wanted to change one character in a specification for trace context. We said, look, why are we discussing about one character for five hours now? It was a long day in Seattle, we were discussing it for five hours. I said, yes, because we have implemented this across all of our cloud service and changing this one character across all of our cloud service is going to cost us a high two digit million dollar in, in R&D cost. So this is, this is one example of like other product integration. It's just different opinions on topics. At some point, you don't need to care. Like if you want to be like really fast and drive the result, yes. Long-term sustainability and industry adoption is a different one. And so certain things you don't need to do, like managing community meetings, getting everything on board, seeing that everybody has time, maybe running a second meeting because somebody couldn't join, you have to do another one, and running it with one internal development team. Code reviews, you want at least three organizations to approve your PR versus just two of your colleagues to approve the PR. What's faster? And I'm not, not saying that open source is a bad idea. You just need to know what you're getting yourself into because I've seen people being frustrated. Building by consensus takes time and effort. It is important for sustainability, but to your point, yes, that's, that's how we came there. open source projects and they do so many beautiful things and their business model is supposed to be based on that. And you seem to have answered this question. You seem to be saying that's not necessarily a good idea to base your business model on an open source project. Uh, let me, and it didn't, yeah. excuse me, just, I'd like to add that it seems based on what you were saying, you guys tried that, but it didn't work. It didn't work for us in, a, in, in that specific way. And we also are a type of company. What, I'm, what I believe in, you can build a business model based on some open source work that is a component of it, but what you shouldn't do, you just shouldn't provide a SaaS service because every cloud provider eventually can do it better than you. And you just shouldn't do it by providing some, some support capabilities or some enterprise capabilities because others will enter your market. What I think does work, you build your open source project to solve one problem that gets your end users into a situation where they then need your commercial product, which always should have at least a different use case and ideally also a different target audience. Looking at open feature, what open feature actually solves is defining and evaluating feature flags. Building an open feature cloud service would be for anybody who would like to be in that area a ridiculous effort because you're never going to make money out of it. Red Hat's going to do it, AWS is going to do it, Google's going to do it. Pick and choose whoever you want, GitLab, like pick whoever you want to do it out there. But if your goal is you want to have standardization on feature flagging because you wanted to build the best 
maybe AI based as we build everything AI based right now, progressive delivery solution, then you have a different business model, you have a different use case, and your differentiation is not uh, the one that you are part of the open source projects. So that, that way you can build something on top of it, but assuming that everybody's using your open source project, which situation are they in where your commercial product is adding additional value to it? So complementary. Kind of complementary, like extending beyond that, that, initial, uh, that initial use case. And so, or it's different. I mean, it's, it's radically different, you could say, or not. Oh, it's, it's, it's just the next step. It's, it's just the next step that users might run into, or you might then, for example, decide, okay, the feature flag is available, but you have the best analytics. Like a lot of problems in feature flagging are find stale flags, find flags that are properly used, which ones and which combinations um, relate to certain problems, doing things like this. But it's not the exact use case. It's, it's usually an on top use case that you need to build on. I think that's a much better idea than just being there because, I mean, we've, we've seen it with companies who try to just provide the service on top how well this actually goes. Yeah, yeah. And what, what happens when you change your business model? How well does this go? Not really, but if your use case is different, that's why we have this question. Everybody's using your open source project for free. For this project, they don't want to buy anything commercial. How is this helping your business? And that's the question. If I was a VC, I would ask somebody uh, getting funding. And if they can't answer it, I would send them back to do their homework because there is always a business case. Examples? Examples, as I mentioned, like for, for like, like the open feature one, we have it obviously people like building the progressive delivery. Or as for open telemetry, it's more the analytics capabilities on top, like storing the massive amounts of data, doing the analytics. So you always have to think it through for, uh, for the individual project. Just stay away from making it uh, just enterprise features as well. Uh, like as part of like the CNCF tech work, I remember one project coming to us that they built the open source solution where you can cross cloud provision your infrastructure. You use a template, you can start uh, like a whole AWS environment, a bit of what, no matter what size. Said, yeah, but how do you do a different open source and uh, commercial? They said, yes. Um, authentication is actually part of the commercial offering because we know that people will use it. And they asked them, do you think anybody in the market will use an automation solution that could in one minute spend $1 million without authentication? But cost optimization in this use case, like which resources you should switch to, understanding patterns when things are working, not working, building like scheduled deployments, like taking things offline, online, depending on workloads, would offer an entirely different approach on how to work with these environments, just to take one. I think it's always a very use case specific, but it's an important question to ask and have an answer for. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, feel free. If you don't want to ask like questions in the background, feel free to also to come over here or find me through the conference, or otherwise it would also be easy to find. Thank you.